Thank you, Brendan, and uh, thank you, Wilhelm and Erno, for the very interesting uh, talk back there. Uh, so, yeah, as Brenda mentioned, my name is uh, Kalle Heikkinen, and I work as a senior analyst at Game Refinery, mainly focusing on keeping our database uh, of Chinese games as up-to-date and as comprehensive as uh, possible. Now, today, uh, I want to talk to you about social elements in mobile gaming about, and about the fact that they are uh, gain, uh, getting more, more and more uh, popular. Hence the name of the talk, Social 2.0, are we entering the new era of mobile social gaming 2.0? And just a brief summary of the things that I would like to go through with you uh, today. Um, so first of all, um, I want to briefly just uh, talk about the different kinds of drivers behind the situation where we are right now. So what is exactly driving us towards mobile gaming that is just more and more socially interactive? Secondly, uh, I want to highlight uh, a recent trend that we are seeing, especially in the Chinese market, which is the social spaces or hangout spaces in mobile games. And I will give you three examples, one from the US market, one from the Japanese market, and one from the Chinese market. We are, apart from these social hangout areas, we are also witnessing a lot of other different kinds of uh, social mechanics getting more and more popular in the mobile gaming landscape. In the third section, I will discuss co-op tasks and guild mechanics in mass tree games. And then finally, I will leave you off with uh, some thoughts uh, on the implications of this transition to more uh, socially, uh, social uh, mobile uh, gaming. So um, last year, uh, I think we can all agree that it was uh, anything but um, ordinary for, for us. Many of the things that um, we've, been, we've taken for granted in the sort of in the old normal, when it comes to things like you know, communicating, socializing, and traveling, for instance, were basically taken away from us. So there was no physically hanging out with friends anymore, no going to movies, no going to see our favorite bands live. And obviously gaming uh, was a part of our, our uh, lives back in the old normal, but it had much harder time in competing for our attention. Now, what happened basically was that we were forced to find new alternative ways to interact with our friends, basically with the world. So what that uh, translated into was getting these experiences through screens, whether it was mobile phone screens or PC screens, uh, but it ended up in a situation where we were doing more Zoom calls, it meant more Netflix binging, and of course, more gaming. And from our perspective, what was really interesting to see was how games started offering different kinds of methods to meet this demand to socialize virtually. And one sort of a manifestation of this that we have seen is the appearance and uh, uh, sort of uh, that we're seeing a lot more is these social hangout areas, and this is especially true in the Chinese market. And I think it's good uh, first to just uh, give a brief definition of what, what, what we actually mean by these social hangout er spaces or areas. So some characteristics. Uh, first of all, they are pretty much unrelated to the main core game gameplay. So if we're talking about a battle royale game or a rhythm dancing game, uh, these social hangout spaces are separate from them, so you don't go there to do this sort of the core gameplay experience. And it's a separate mode from the sort of the main uh, the core gameplay experiences. It can be private so, or it can be a public space. And they're not necessarily gamified experiences, per se. Um, so the main motivation to engage with these modes is usually not to go to play the game exactly, but more to 
to socialize and, and basically just to hang out, spend time with other players or your friends or your guildmates or, or things like that. And it's all about this social interaction with other players. So things that you do in these modes are things like um, chatting through, through te text chat or a voice chat. There are oftentimes there are mini games available, like rock, paper, scissors, for example. Uh, this is also a great place to ex get your cosmetics exposed. So, so oftentimes you, you want to show, show them to your, your friends and these hangout modes are a great place to do that. You can listen to music with your friends, for example, or you organize different kinds of um, events, parties in there. And they have basically two main functions. So the first one is that they are facilitating this player-led social interaction. So the players go there and they themselves sort of uh, form up the social interaction that happens there. But then there's the other layer that these so the social hangout places can also be used by the game developers themselves to serve as a platform to organize game-led social events. So think about these uh, big concerts in, in games like Fortnite or Roblox, for example. So next up, I want to give you a couple of examples of these Hangout modes. Um, and I think we can start with uh, Roblox, which, as we all know, uh, is a game that is all about user-generated games inside this game that is Roblox. Uh, and for us, it's been really interesting to follow how uh, players have started to utilize the platform in, in different ways during the COVID, COVID times. And one manifestation of this was the appearance of these different uh, so-called party modes, where players were able to organize, for example, their birthday parties or graduation ceremonies and so on. So that was really interesting thing to, to see. Then I have a couple of examples of these sort of uh, game-led uh, social events. So one of them is the a little Nas X concert experience that happened uh, inside Roblox in uh, last November. Uh, 30 million Roblox players witnessed this uh, spectacular uh, concert unfold. And Roblox also had an incredibly unique uh, collaboration event with the Ready Player um, two franchise, so Ready Player Two is the sequel to the Ready Player One um, novel, and one part of this event uh, was this social uh, hangout area that you can see in the screen, uh, where you could be with the other players and live take part into a showing uh, of a Q&A session with the author of this uh, Ready Player Two novel. Then I have an example from uh, Japan, uh, from a game called Project Sekai Colorful Stage featuring Hatsune Miku. Quite a mouthful of a name, <laughs> but um, this game uh, has a really great example uh, of, uh, of emulating live concerts without having these sort of an expensive collaborations with A-list stars, so, so, so a different kind of approach to, for example, the, the Lil Nas X uh, concert. Because in this mode and in this game, the game utilizes the NPC, NP, uh, the, the non-playable characters in the game that players are already familiar with. And so what this me, uh, mode is all about is that, it, first of all, it's called virtual life. And it does a really nice job uh, in emulating this live show experience from, you know, pre-show merchandise sellers, you go there, you purchase, for example, different kinds of emotes that you can, you know, use uh, in the live uh, show experience, uh, all the way to the actual live performance where you can, you know, wave light sticks, you can send emotes, cheers to the performance, and you can also check around and see that how are the other participants of this uh, event um, reacting to the, to the live show. And uh, one cool thing uh, about this is that there is 
this sort of an afterlife lobby area uh, as well, where after the show players can go to and you know hang out with each other. And our analyst actually, uh, when she went to this uh, this uh, lobby area, um, she happened to witness a couple of these ten-year-old uh, kids to actually make friends. Uh, uh, in the in the lobby area, so I think that was really cool and a sort of a powerful ex, uh, example of uh, of what these uh, hangout modes can be cap uh, capable of. Then I have one example for China. Um, as I mentioned, there are quite a lot, uh, quite many games that are utilizing these um, hangout modes, but QQ Dancer is one of them. So it's a rhythm uh, dancing game that has a separate. Um, hangout mode for people to go to socialize with each other. Uh, in this mode, players can obviously communicate with each other, they can use chat, voice chat, they can even draw stuff on a whiteboard, as you can see from the screenshot that I have on the top right corner, so you can draw stuff there and show it to other people. Players can play mini games, they can take photos together, there's a separate fo photo mode uh, that you can use different kinds of filters and, and stuff like that. And, and, and there's a lot of live event content related to the, to the mode too, uh, like limited time gotchas that are only accessible within this mode, for example. Um, and as QQ Dancer is a music rhythm game, Cosmetic items play a huge role in the monetization scheme. So getting more exposure to the cosmetic content is definitely something uh, that can be seen as a big upside of this, uh, of this mode. Now, apart from these social hangout spaces, uh, we have been witnessing a lot of other features, social features, getting more and more traction. Um, and here I would just like to highlight uh, two of them. First one uh, is co-op tasks. What co-op tasks basically means that it's a task system that rewards players based on how they communally contribute to this task system. So in other words, the more everyone weighs in to the, to the task system, the more they do these tasks, the better the rewards for everyone participating in the system. Now this uh, example picture that I have here happens to be from a game uh, called World of Tong Tank uh, Blitz, uh, which happened to witness more than 50% revenue uplift seven days after they added the co-op task system. And I also have a data point uh, here on the co-op tasks. Uh, so here we can see that uh, looking at the last couple of years in the US market, the popularity of co-op tasks within top 100 crossing games has risen significantly. The other uh, example that I want to use here is uh, guild mechanics uh, in match three games. In the last year, we witnessed a lot of the top match three games to add guilds. Games like uh, Candy Crush, French Saga, Lily's Garden, uh, Clockmaker, and Sweet Escapes, to name a few. Guilds are a great foundational social feature. What I mean by that is that they provide an excellent base to build upon your toolkit of social features. So I think it is more than likely that this year we will see many of these games on this list to expand their social features, expand their guild systems even more. And if we're looking at, if we're interested in data on, 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 on guild systems, I have it right here. So uh, within match three games, guild mechanics in the last 12 months have also uh, increased in popularity quite a lot uh, from uh, 30% approximately to 50% within match three. And then um, in the end, uh, uh, I just wanna talk a little bit about the sort of the different kinds of uh, implications of this uh, social 2.0 to, to, to games. And obviously the first one is that this is definitely a thing that is boosting driving retention. So if players are socially engaged with your game, for example, through a guild system, they will come back, they will be re-engaged, 
they will pull their weight, they will help their guild, they will help their friends, uh, they will not let them down. So if you have these systems in place, you can be pretty assured that, uh, that the players have a pretty big social um, retention incentives to come back to the, to the game. Then obviously it drives monetization as well, because if the players are socially engaged with your game, they are also engaged with your game uh, more overall. And that means that they are more exposed to different types of content that you have in the game, uh, and also the money sinks that you have in the game. So, and, and features such as guild mechanics, they also allow to expand your economy. Think of, for example, having a guild shop or guild special guild currencies uh, within your guild system. And then it drives marketability and UA uh, as well, because social and PvP games, they happen to be one of the most streamed uh, games out there. And if your game is socially engaging, meaning that it has these co-op systems, skill systems, PvP possibility, and so on, players will organically uh, invite their friends to share the playing experience with them. And how then will Social 2.0 continue to evolve in mobile gaming? Well, first of all, I think one question that is very crucial is that uh, what will the post-pandemic world look for the mobile gaming? So what kind of shift can we expect to reward activities? Is this going to be a very dramatic shift back to the old normal? Or is sort of the growth of these virtual social experiences having more different ways to engage with games socially as well? Is that going to continue? One thing we can expect to happen is that the trend of adding more social features to mobile games, especially casual games, will continue. I think that's, that's, that's a pretty safe assumption to make. And I think we'll see more experimentation with these uh, social uh, hangout spaces also in the Western uh, uh, markets as well. As I said, uh, it's more, more something that we're seeing in the, in, the, in the, for example, in the Chinese market, but I do believe that uh, this is something that uh, uh, will see more experimentation in the West as well. And I think just one more thing that um, might be interesting to follow uh, is the sort of the applications of uh, AR and, and, and VR uh, and how they can possibly be used to enhance the immersion of these uh, social uh, experiences. So if we think about, for example, the, the movie showings or the virtual concerts or the, or the virtual live in the, in the, um, in the Project Sekai uh, game that I was uh, discussing, um, applying uh, AR or VR to them uh, can also be something that uh, uh, could be used there as, as, uh, as well. All right, uh, with that, um, I want to thank you for uh, listening uh, to this uh, talk and uh, excited to hear any questions you guys might have. Super, thank you so much, Kale. Wow, great presentation, really, thank really you. great insights. And we got a lot of questions on it as well, right? Excellent. And I would say a couple of the final points, let's say, that you were making there, right? I think not only were your insights, let's say, very valid, and let's say, like, it's good to sort of see, let's say, you know, what's happening, but a couple of things where you mentioned there, let's say, about casual games, which have, I guess, notoriously been kind of, let's say, a little bit light and stuff like that, right? Yeah. That, that they're opening up now to have a lot more social, because, of course, the world is different. This is how people, let's say, do. Do you see that this is kind of, let's say, the glass ceiling, let's say, on um, social, that one, sorry, on casual, so that when you bring social, now there's a lot of other stuff, let's say, that, that, that's coming. That's a, that's a very, very, very good point. I, I think that the, sort of the, the social features getting more, more popularity uh, in casual games is just, it's maybe it's a big part of the picture, but it's just one part of the picture. So as you mentioned, I think that, the, for example, the adding different kinds of meta elements to, to casual games uh, is something that uh, we are seeing a lot 
happening in the market. So adding narrative stuff, adding, uh, for example, light um, construction elements, adding different kinds of decoration elements, collection elements to these casual uh, games is something that we're seeing a lot. And it's a very positive thing for games. It opens up a lot of different uh, opportunities to monetization, for example, through the cosmetics, through the collection economy. Uh, and I think for certain player segments, these things are very important. So for example, if we think about the narrative thing, uh, I think certain player personas are especially interested in getting the sort of a storyline experience. And, and if your game is able to cater to those per player persona types, those uh, specific uh, player segments, uh, that's only a positive thing. Because it's already there's already been a bit of a testing lab for those particular features already in the mid core as well, isn't there? Yeah. So as you said, if you know kind of let's say what let's you know the what what, what the audience likes. Yeah. Go and take a look. Let's say at mid core, they've probably gone through a lot of the learnings and stuff like that. Exactly. That seems to be the, uh, like uh, you, you put it put it so well. I think that's definitely something that we've seen happening. That that the de developers are looking at what is working in the mid core space and thinking about is there are there elements, are there game features, are there systems that could work in the casual space uh, as well, or could they work if we put a sort of a different kind of twist. Uh, into it, make it more, maybe more approachable, easier to understand, and, and, and so on. So, yeah. yeah and I then think you're on point there. But, but I think you're an expert as well at the ultimate AB test lab as well, right? We, which is the Chinese game market, right? Where maybe, uh, how, would, how would I put it in a nice way that, you know, maybe companies over here think, oh, well, we, we make games to entertain and stuff like that. And not to, to say that they don't do that as well. It's like, yeah, but we're going to make sure that it's like it's a business. We got like, you know, the 996 yeah. for, for some, obviously not everybody, but, you know, but like really putting it out there and let's say trying everything because we've seen games, like if we go back to what the other guys were saying earlier about Battle Pass, we've seen battle passes, subscription plans, VIP systems, all in the same game. Because of course, there's a lot of, let's say trial and error, throw the spaghetti at the wall. So I'm sure you've seen quite a lot of interesting things coming from the mid core over there. De definitely, definitely. If we think about the social elements, I think even even there, it, there are a lot of things that uh, we're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of things happening in China that we haven't seen in the West. So for instance, uh, these sort of social relationship systems where you have like a, a master Padawan systems, or, or maybe may you can even get married in these games. And what that means is that there's a uh, structured system that um, if, you, if you are, for example, a master Padawan, uh, that the sort of the, uh, the master who has played the game more uh, will teach the Padawan, you know, the tricks of the, of the trade, and they have a specific quest system, for example, that they both need to progress through this quest system. Uh, and through that, if they both do that, they both are rewarded and they gain levels and, and, and stuff like that. So uh, there are interesting features, interesting um, sort of an Asian only, China only things uh, going on there. That's, that's a really interesting way of taking the whole Sherpa thing, isn't it? That there's actually the reward in making it, that it's the shared journey and stuff like that. Okay, okay I think we've got a couple of other questions, let's say from, um, yeah, so, um, what do you think is different when comparing Chinese games to Western ones? Is there something Western companies could learn from them? Well, yeah, the one thing that we are seeing, uh, if we look at the Chinese, uh, the top crossing games, if that's what we do, um, is that they are so heavy on, on content, so heavy on uh, live ops cadence, for example. Like when you open up these games, you go to the uh, event menu, what happens is that it opens up like 20 different uh, seasons, like their seasonal event content. There can be a promotional event content. They might have IP crossover uh, events going on. Obviously, tons of different kinds of uh, limited time promotions, discounts going on. So if we, if you just look at the live ops only from like even from 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 that perspective, you easily easily see that it's it's on a totally sort of different uh, level and cadence. 
Um, have you seen any differences in how social elements are trending in different markets? Yeah. So um, the one key th thing I already already mentioned was the was the the relationship thing. But I think another thing is that we are also seeing experimentation with uh, different kinds of uh, uh, game features. So I think the guys also mentioned this that uh, in a couple of Chinese games I've, I've seen these co-op uh, battle passes gaining traction. So you are adding social elements uh, to this retention slash monetization mechanic which I think is really really uh, interesting yeah, it so so it's it's adding that extra layer of uh, of sort of uh, incentivization for you to keep on doing the battle pass because if you don't pull your weight your friend will not get the rewards either so you are really really incentivized to you know do your part one last question for you let's say on Chinese games we all know they're very heavy right <laughs> so much boost so many collectibles so many offers and stuff like that how many games could you have going at one time? How many? How could you? How could you? Is that is, is that why there's autoplay? <laughs> good, good, good question. The autoplay actually helps uh, quite a lot because then, yeah, I can have uh, simultaneously a lot of uh, different games uh, going on. Obviously, uh, depending on the genre, some of them only require me to do, you know, 15 minutes a day if I have to, you know, make a building construction in a four game, four X game, for instance. But um, but yeah, it's uh, let's put it this way, that uh, their content doesn't run out. Yeah. <laughs> so I always have something to play. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right, well, listen, thanks, man. Wonderful, wonderful to have you here. Great, great in insights. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's our pleasure.